Well, church family, I hope you are excited today. We have the opportunity to go to God's Word together as we continue our little mini-series called Beyond Giving. And so if you've got your Bible, I would encourage you to get open to the book of Matthew today. We're going to be in chapter 25, and we're going to be looking today at a question that I think is relevant for all of us, uh, especially in our downtown community with so many achievement-minded people. Goodness, I love you. And the question is, what is success? Does anybody want to be successful in life? Come on, guys. I know you, right? What is success, and how do we attain it? More importantly today, as we have been focusing in these weeks around God's word to us related to money, I could reframe the question. It's not on the screen, but just for you to think about it. What is financial success? I mean, really. How do you know when you've been successful? How do you attain it? This morning, we're going to be looking at this question as we get back into our series, Beyond Giving. And it's been my heart throughout this series to help you know, like, our church is fine financially. Like, this is not about a campaign. This is not about a need for us to raise money. In fact, we haven't taught on money in many, many, many years. This is not some gimmick um, in order to grab cash, so to speak, or build organization or institution or anything like that. I know there's a, typically a lot of skepticism and reluctance and just privacy and individualism as it relates to money. It's hard for us to open ourselves up to even talk about this. But pastorally, I've told you over the last weeks, so I really think we need to talk about this. And the reason we need to talk about this is because really the conversation about money that God wants to have with us is about so much more than just the cash in our pockets. It's about God wanting to chase after our hearts. God has all resources. He doesn't need money. Jesus is not broke. He's not cash poor. And it's certainly not a gimmick. He's not on some power trip. In fact, the one who wants to talk to you about money is the one who gave his life for you, who lived poor, gave himself sacrificially, even unto death for you. I think there's something that he wants to say to us that's more than just trying to grab your cash. Jesus wants to talk to us about money because the Bible again and again teaches us that money is directly connected to our hearts. We've been looking at this one verse from Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, and you've heard it now for several weeks in a row, so if you don't mind, read it with me on the screen. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So you see that there's this direct connection between our hearts and our money. And what I've been saying again and again in this series is that if we could really open ourselves to listen to this conversation about money, it, it, it really is best for us because God is chasing our hearts. He's not chasing our money. God is after your heart. But because he's after your heart, he's got to talk to you about money. Because as we looked at last week, money sets itself up as a great substitute, a great alternative, a great competitor to God. It is so easy to look to money to satisfy you, to look to money, to secure you, to look to money, to give you joy, to look to money, to have some sense of purpose, to look to money, to, uh, to define what it is that is success. It is so easy. Money sets itself up as a great alternative to God in our hearts. And God knows that we're tempted to look to the wrong place for what we need. We really need to be looking to God. So God says to us, hey, hey, I want to talk to you about your money because I, I, I want to pull you out of the deception that money is. I want to pull you out of the burden that it is. I want to pull you out of, of the enslavement that it is to give yourself to money. I want your heart. Your heart is not meant for money. Your heart is meant for me. So I want to talk to you about your money because I am after your heart. Everybody get it? So in this series, we've been walking through looking at something beyond just the cash that we give out of our pocket or the transfers from our accounts, but looking at what God desires from our heart. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All right, so this week, we are on our third week, and if you remember 
Uh, and if you're taking notes, and I hope you would this morning, I would highly encourage you this morning. I, I uh, love note takers because I believe note takers are disciple makers. All right, that rhymes. And I like the rhyme too. But um, I always love it uh, to see folks who are engaged in learning the scripture so that you can live in it, but also so you can turn around and transfer it to someone else. We've been on this journey. This is our third week. So far, we've talked about how God is pursuing in our hearts a couple of things. First, we've been talking about how he's pursuing worship from us, right? Recognizing that he is a great giver in our life. He who is rich became poor so that we who are in our poverty could become rich. What a great and generous God we have. So he looks at us and he says, you're made in my image and I am generous. I'm not, I don't hoard for myself. I give. I've given everything to you. Don't you see how much I've given? So as he asks us to give, he's asking us to recognize how he has given to us. And he's also asking us to bear his image in the world that needs to know our generous, generous God. Secondly, we looked not only at how God is after our worship, but last week we looked at how God is after our trust. Y'all remember this conversation? How ultimately we need to look to money. Excuse me. No, 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 no. You should throw rocks at me if I did not correct myself. How we need to look to God and not money to meet our needs. God is our true provider, not money. And one of the things that God is asking us to do is to let go of our money. And gee, willikers, isn't it hard to let go of the first 10% as a tithe before you pay the rest of your bills? That is so difficult. It feels excruciatingly painful to, for, to receive money. And then the first thing we do with it, to obey God and to let it go. Why is he commanding us to do that? He's commanding us to do it because he knows that if we divest ourselves of the first portion of that money, then we'll be having to trust God and not money for the rest of the week or the rest of the month. God is after our hearts. He wants us to trust him deeply. And he promises that for those who trust him, they will never be in lack. In fact, they'll have abundance. Worship. God's after your heart. Trust. God's after your heart. Are y'all ready for the third one? You're like, you haven't told me anything new yet. Here we go. Uh, For those who have missed in these weeks, you can always go back and watch or listen online. But today we're going to be talking about how God is after stewardship. What a big word. This is is not like the last few weeks. It doesn't roll off the tongue quite so nice. But one of the things that God is after in all of our hearts is he's wanting to to teach us to be better stewards of what he has given us. God is after stewardship. So this morning, today's message, if you're taking notes, the title of today's message is Giving Grows Stewardship. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. The main point this morning is this. Hopefully you can write it down. Giving helps us learn to live all of our life in submission To God. In fact, one of the main things that God is doing inside of your heart, deep within you, as He's calling you to take cash out of your pocket and to let it go, is He is working in your heart to grow your submission to Him. He's growing in you an increasingly submitted heart. Giving helps us learn to live all of our life in submission to God. Giving grows stewardship. Now, when I say stewardship, uh, I looked it up in Merriam-Webster um, just to provide a basic definition, and it fits with the biblical definition of the word, so we're going to use it, okay? Stewardship, they define as the careful and responsible management of something that is entrusted to one's care. So when we're talking about stewardship, we're saying, look, you're being careful and you're being responsible when somebody entrusts something to you. That's what it means to be a good steward. And what you need to know is that the Bible is clear about a calling that we have on our lives. We are called to live in stewardship of the resources that God has given us. Careful 
and responsible management of the things that he has put into our care. Um, another way that I could say this, a little simpler, a um, little less Merriam-Webster-ish, okay? Here it goes. Y'all, um, you're a manager, you're not an owner. Okay? So one of the things you've got to recognize just in life but the stuff that's in your care is like you don't actually own it. God speaks to us through his word and he wants us to recognize like actually like he owns it. We manage it. We are managers and not owners. And because we're managers, we've got to figure out how to be managers that steward what he owns with responsibility and care. Okay? Uh, verse for this, I'll, I'll give you one right now, and then we'll eventually look at a couple of others. But just to reinforce this, First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 14. The point that I just made comes straight from the Scripture. As a pastor, faithful pastor, I seek to be here. I don't want to say things to you that are not just direct from the Scripture. So when I'm making a point, I'm making it directly from what God has already pointed out in his word. Second Chronicles 29, 14, he says, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. Now, this is a time where they were presenting offerings to God and they're going essentially in the Old Testament, like, yo, like, who are, who are we that we should even be able to, like, give you this? It would be like, um, some of us have little children. It'd be like the equivalent, there, there are times where uh, we've been in a situation where, like, Emma Grace, uh, she goes, I, I want to give you something for Valentine's Day, all right? Oh, so sweet. We're in the store. Can I have $10? Yeah. (laughs) Yes. So you give her the money, right? She goes and picks out the present. She comes back. How stupid would it be for her to come back and be like, look how how awesome I am. Look at what I did. I had the $10 and I bought you all this. But she comes back and she gives the gift. And and we receive it with great joy because it came from her heart. But she's got to know, and we certainly know, hey, like, look, like, just like they're saying in the Old Testament, who are we to even give you this or to be proud of this? Like, we recognize that even in giving you this, we're, we're just giving back to you something you've already given to us. For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. Here's the biblical teaching. God is the rightful owner of all that we have, not us. God is the rightful owner of all that we have, not us. So the point, the main point of today's sermon is as we give, here's what happens. In our hearts, it's like in the moment of giving, like that connects, that truth that we just discussed, it ought to connect. Because in giving, what we're doing is saying, God, we recognize that all of this comes from you And you're the one that gets to decide what you want us to do with it. We are stewards of what you have given. We're the managers, not the owners. So if you say give, God, we will give. So as we give in obedience, we're actually teaching our heart. We're we're reinforcing this truth. We are managers, not owners. God, this is all from you and this is all for you. You are the owner, not me. Does that make sense? That is the heart of today's sermon. Giving grows stewardship. Y'all ever been to Kroger? I'm trying to get 100% participation this morning on something. Okay? All right. Anybody ever been to Kroger on Union? Is this the best or worst Kroger? I don't know. All right? This picture has got to be the best. This is the best looking and the best operating that Kroger has ever been because this is the concept drawing. Um, it was it was a great Kroger um, at this point. 
Um, seriously, there, there used to be an old grocery store right here where this Kroger was, and they tore that one down. They built this one, and it's great. We were just there yesterday. Um, I'm heading out this afternoon with a few from our church. We'll pray later in their service for this. We're heading out to train 100 pastors and church planters in India uh, this week. And please be praying for that. We're going to be training them in the book of Lamentations. I was there at the grocery store picking up um, stomach meds and some snack, nutritious foods, and some other things like that just for our trip. And, you know, I was thinking about this. Um, imagine going to the grocery store, right? I take our daughter, Caroline. Imagine taking Caroline to the grocery store. And I take her in there, and I just made this little joke about, you know, Emma giving her money for a Valentine's present. But let's say I take Caroline to the grocery store, and because I'm trying to teach her independence, right, teach her how to grow up a bit, I take out of my pocket 10 $10 bills. So $100 cash divided into tens. All right, Caroline, it's Kroger, and we're going to have a fun day, and I'm going to let you do the, the purchasing today. So here's $100, 10 $10 bills. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the first $10 bill, and I want you to just hand it back to me. Then I want you to take the rest of the money, and what I really want from Kroger today is I would like steak and potatoes, right? About to go on a trip. Would love a good meal before I go. If we could just pick, pick out some good steak, some potatoes, and then... After that, what I'd like for you to do is just make your way back to the register, and there's a lady there at the register. You'll look for her. Her name is Tamika. She's going through a hard time, and whatever is left over, Caroline, here's what I want you to do. It's just after you buy the steak and potatoes, make sure you check out with Tamika. I just want you to turn around and give her the extra cash, all right? And then just come back to me, and we'll go back home. Cook it all. It'll be a great night. Great. Let Caroline go. I'm watching making sure she's safe. She comes back and reports, hey, hey, she's got the bags in her hand. Hey, Dad, it was a great trip. I'm like, really great. Okay, yeah. And she's like, well, yeah, so what'd you do with the, with the money? What, what'd you get? She said, well, first of all, I'm sorry that I didn't give you the first $10. I just decided I, wa I was really nervous that I wasn't going to have enough money for the shopping. So what I decided to do is I just kept the first $10 just in case I'd, I, I needed it later on. And, and I got back to the steak and potatoes and I was like, that's, I just don't like steak. I know dad likes steak, but I don't really want steak. That's kind of boring. So I went over the frozen section of dad, you know, those frozen meals that I love, the meatloaf and the mashed potatoes, the ones that you microwave. She said, I got two of them. She said, I'm so excited we got frozen meals. She said, but I realized they're so cheap. They were on sale today, and I had all this extra money left over. So, Dad, it was really cool because when I was going back from the frozen section, I went down the chip aisle, and they had the sour cream and onion chips. We love those, Dad, and the cool ranch chips. They are awesome. So I got a couple of bags of those, and then I realized I still had a lot of money over, left over. So I decided, Dad, I went over to the girls in my class. They, like, love this new lip gloss stuff. So I went and shopped the lip gloss stuff and some, some new stuff over there, and I was, like, really excited about it. And so I went to check out with, the, with all the stuff, Dad, and I got to the register, and there was a book that I've been wanting to see. They had it right there by the register, and so I just was like, I just can't not buy it. I have enough money. So I bought all the stuff, Dad, and I'm back. Here's all the stuff. And I look at her. <laughs> okay, Caroline, um, what... What about Tamika? Like, did, did you at least give the leftover to Tamika? Well, Dad, I didn't really have any leftover because there was so much else that I wanted. How do you think I would feel in that moment? I guess the question would be, was she successful? I mean, I guess you would have to ask the question, well, successful in whose view? Because I, I, I guess that we would need to de define what success is, right? Because ultimately it depends on this reality. Is Caroline... An owner, or is she a manager? Based on that answer, you can define pretty easily, was she successful? 
was the $100 hers to decide what to do with? Was it hers to go in and go, well, I'm not going to give the first $10, and I really don't want the steak and potatoes, and I really want my own frozen meal and my own makeup, and I just want to use the excess on a book that I want rather than to give it to Tamika. What, I mean, she thought, coming back to me, she was successful. She's got a grin on her face. Look at all that I got to do with my money. But from my perspective, which probably you're relating to today, how do you think I view her success? Was she actually successful? And the answer would be no. Because success is defined by the one who owns and who entrusts and asks and empowers and invites to come back with faithfulness. And in my view, I look at her and I'm like, you, you didn't do anything that I asked you to do. And this wasn't yours to do what you wanted with. This was yours to be faithful to what I asked. Now, I say all that to say, I want you to turn open to Matthew chapter 25. Because in a very direct way, Jesus invites us to consider in our own hearts and in our own lives how we view success, but also to consider how he views it, more importantly. Matthew 25, our core text for the day, and it's quite simple but profound in Jesus' teaching. Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's talking to them about what his kingdom is like, and what it's going to be like when he comes back. And he begins to tell them this story. He says, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servant and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. To each according to his ability. And then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you you have delivered to me five talents, and here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also He also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, so I will set over you much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reaped where I have not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him. Give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into outer darkness, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Interesting little story Jesus tells, is it not? 
And he tells it because he's trying to get through to your heart. He who has ears, let him hear. What is success? I told you the story of Caroline, and I told you that it depended on the view. Is she an owner or a manager? I asked the question, and the most important story today is not the one that I illustrated from Kroger, but the one that Jesus gives us in his true and living word. And he's trying to define for you, and I don't know if you're willing to listen, but I sure hope you are, because he's trying to say to you, hey, like, I've got a view of your success, and I'm wondering, like, do you see your success the way I see it? And the story that he tells is a story that's basically challenging whether or not you see yourself as an owner or as a manager. And I don't know how you see yourself and what you have. But I know how God sees you. And I know how God sees what you have. And I know how he defines success. And there's three ways from this parable, I believe, that you can see how he defines success for you. The question is, I don't know if you can embrace it, but I hope today you will. Because he's speaking truth to you. And the one who knows what it's going to be like in the end is trying to get your attention so that you don't miss it along the way. Success defined three ways according to this parable. Number one, seeing everything is from God. Seeing everything that you have is from God. In other words, success for you is going to be dependent on whether or not you answer the question, is it, am I an owner or a manager? That's the question that you're wrestling with in your hearts, with what you have. Success is dependent on you answering that question, I am a manager, not an owner. God is the owner. If you want to be successful in life and successful with money, it starts by you going, God, it's all yours. Here's from the parable why I want to teach you this. Verse 14, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servant and entrusted to them. So notice, the one who's got the money in his hands, he's not the owner of the money. He's a steward of the money. It has been entrusted to him. It's been given to him in his care. Notice also the language there in verse 14. He said he trusted to them what? His property. Do y'all see that next phrase? He entrusted to them his property. To the one he gave five talents. So this is not the ones who are handling the money. It's not actually their money. They had been given to this by a master. They were servants. It had been entrusted to them. They were called to steward what was not their own. So the first principle here is to recognize this is not mine. Just like Caroline in the grocery store, this is not my money. I don't get to decide how to use this money. This has been entrusted to me. I've got to be careful with this. I've got to be responsible with this. This is not mine. Dad says he gives me the first $10. I'm going to give him the first $10. Dad says he wants steak and potatoes. I'll do that. Dad says he wants to help Tamika. I'm going to help Tamika. It's not mine to decide what I do with it. It's God's. So if you want to learn financial success, the starting point is to see everything as from God. Secondly, success is defined as desiring to honor God with what he has given us. Success is actually found when from your heart you're going, God, you're asking this question, what do you want me to do? How, how many times, I really mean this, this is not just a, a pastor talk thing. I'm trying to talk very practically, very personally to you. How many times when you get income, whether it's a weekly check, maybe it's a project-based event, maybe it's a loan deposit, maybe it's a special gift, maybe it's an inheritance, a sell of a home. How many times when you receive income in any of those forms, do you actually go to the owner of that who's given it to you and say, what do you want me to do with this? 
That would be success in the owner's eyes. For you not to just quickly assume, I know what's best. I know what I want to do. I know, I know my way with this money. How many times do we actually, as the children of God, actually go to the Father and say, Father, I know you've given this to me. you put this in my hands. Father, what do you want me to do with this? Success is actually from your heart, not just recognizing that he owns it, but then actually desiring to know how he wants you to use it, desiring to honor him with what he gives. Look at verse 23. Note to the two who were found to be good stewards of what was entrusted to them, right? They were the ones who were like, hey, I I think I know what he wants, so I'm going to do what he wants and not what I want. Those who were found to be good stewards, note what the master said to them. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. The whole the thing I want you to just pay attention to here and for it to allure you is the idea of faithfulness with money. What does it look like? Have you ever considered it? What would it look like for you to be found faithful with what God has given to you? So whenever you get income, no matter what it is, no matter how frequently it is, what does it look like for you to be found faithful for, for Jesus to look at you and say, good and faithful servant with what I have entrusted to you, good and faithful job. My guess is that for a lot of us, we're not even, we're not even asking the question. We're not even considering perhaps what it is that he would want. Or perhaps we haven't studied God's word to actually discover his principles for money. Perhaps it is that we've heard him say, I I want the first portion to go to me, and and we're going, actually, no, um, we're going to keep it for ourselves because we're kind of worried about how this month's going to shake out. He's like, oh, really? Like, I asked, this is my money. I've asked that to come to me, and I told you I'd take care of the rest if you would do that. Are we found faithful? Are we found faithful when we hear his instructions to be wary of debt? Are we found faithful when we hear his warnings not to be a lover of money, not to be greedy, but to be selfless? Not to store up too much for ourselves, but to be generous with the poor. To be concerned for others as we are concerned for ourselves. There are many books that we put out in the resource library. There's no, there's no real excuse for us in 2024 if we go, well, I don't know what it looks like to be faithful. I mean, there are people who have written extensively. We put out several books out there in the library. They've been out there for weeks. Hopefully you've scanned the codes, perhaps bought some of these on Amazon. I mean, you could buy so many resources that help to unpack this. We've taught series upon series here in our church. We've got classes that you can take. We'd be glad to sit down with you, any of our finance team members, and help you learn God's way with money in a personal coaching kind of way, discipleship way. There's really no excuse for us when we go, well, I don't know what God wants. He's made it plain to us. There is a way of faithfulness that God invites us into. He gives us clear instruction. I really believe that the issue in this category, I mean, it could be ignorance. And if it's ignorance, educate yourself. I think that one of the reasons we don't want to be educated is it's it's deeper than just the education itself. It's our hearts. I believe many of us don't want for God to tell us how to use our money because our hearts are self-centered or lack self-discipline. I really believe that the issue here is one of the heart. Do you desire, the second point, to honor God with what he has given you. God, what do you want? Would you just learn to ask that question? And would you learn to hear him say, good and faithful servant, thank you for being faithful with what I've entrusted you. The third and the final definition of success that I see from this parable is this. 
trusting and following God and his way as the best. Trusting and following God and his way as the best. If you look at verse 26, the thing that the master comes back and says is he says, "Uh, like, seriously? So like, because the guy who had the one talent, he makes this like grand excuse. He's like, you know, I had the one talent, but I, I, I knew you to be this kind of person. And I just wasn't, I just wasn't, I just wasn't sure if it's like, that was like really the best thing. And so like, I just decided to do my own thing with the talent. I'm paraphrasing here. This is the message version. So I just decided to do my own thing, and, I, and I'm just over here. I, I know that you say this, and you want this, but ah, I'm just not sure that's best. That's kind of the attitude. And the master, Jesus says the master goes, you knew, wait, 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 so you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and I gather where I've scattered my seed, so you actually knew what I wanted. He's actually putting it back in his So you, you knew, Caroline, that I wanted steak and potatoes. Like, you weren't unclear about that. We weren't unclear. Like, you knew. How, how could you think that you know best than me? And then he says in verse 29, if you look back at the text, he commends, he says, for everyone who has more will be given he will have an abundance. The one who has not, even if he has to take it away. So he's, he's commending those who knew the master's heart and way and considered it best. And, and they leaned into that and more came back. He says, to them, even more will be given. Success is found when you actually trust that his way is the best way. And not just trust, but when you actually follow it. It's one thing to have a heart for it. It's another thing to make a plan. It's one thing to go, oh, you know, I trust that God wants me to tithe. It's a whole other thing to take 10%, the first 10% of what you have in income, and to write a check or to make a transfer. That is a whole different thing. It is a heart thing, and it is a practice thing. It's an obedience thing. Success is found. It's not just those who had the heart for it. It was also those who actually followed it up with the right actions. Trusting and following God. God, your way is the best. That's what it looks like. A threefold definition of success right here from the parable. And what I am trying to say to you today, and I'm about to close, is that God is wanting to rewire your heart to see success his way. He's wanting to grow a heart of stewardship in you. That's the title of today's message. Giving grows stewardship, right? And truly, he's wanting to grow this in you. The main point that I told you is giving helps us to live all of our life in submission to God. What God is working in you is a submitted heart. He's trying to cultivate in your heart less self-centeredness and more God-centeredness. He's trying to extract from you that fleshly temptation to be the owner and to put in you, no, I'm not the owner, I'm the manager. God is at work in your heart. I close by just giving one final story from the gospel, and it's from Luke 12. Someone in the crowd one day when Jesus was teaching yelled out at him, and they were like, hey, teacher, he's talking to Jesus, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. So apparently they've gotten an inheritance. There's a dispute among the family. This happens a lot. Pastorally, we've seen it many, many times. When money gets involved, what you see is all kinds of greed because our hearts chase the wrong thing. Family dispute, how much money here, how much money there, who gets this house, who gets this account, is it even, is it blah, blah, blah. And he's calling out to Jesus about all this. Help me, help me, I, 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 I want my fair share of money. But Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? In other words, Jesus is like, I'm out, yo. This is not my problem. But then, what is Jesus' problem? What is something that he's willing to take on? It's not just selling the, settling the dispute about money. Again, he's trying to go deeper. And this morning as I close, I am trying to say to you, Jesus is trying to go deeper than your money. He's trying to get to your heart. 
And because he's trying to get to these guys' hearts, he then follows it up and he tells this little story. And he said to the two boys that are squabbling over cash, guys, take care. and Be on your guard against all kind of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told him a parable. And he said, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, oh, well, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, well, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, oh, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. So relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. For this night, your soul is required of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? Jesus turns around at the guys and he says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Friends, God is not chasing your money. He is chasing your hearts. What is success? Who are you going to let define it? The guy here in the story that Jesus is talking about had to find it his way. I'm the owner. I get to decide. This is what I think is best. And in the end, God looks at him and goes, how could you be so foolish? You consider yourself successful, and maybe others do too, but I'm telling you, I see your soul. And what I'm looking for is not your bigger barns. I'm looking for your heart. Do you see that everything you have comes from me? Do you desire to honor me with it? And do you trust that my way is better than yours? Come back to me. (laughs) When you want to talk about real success, Jesus is saying, for success, as it relates to money, comes from a yielded heart. The main point this morning, in giving, we learn to live all of our life in submission to God. So therefore, the prayer every time we give is this, the prayer that we can pray. You know, the last few weeks we've been talking about the first week of worship, you know, it's God, I worship you. Last week, it's God, I trust you. But in this area of stewardship, as we give, one of the prayers that we should be praying is, God, I honor you. God, I honor you. God, in giving, I am here to tell you, I understand that it comes from you. I desire to be good and faithful with what you've entrusted to me. God, you're the owner, I'm the manager, and I want to be faithful according to your ways. I trust you and what is best. And Lord, I am learning in increasing ways that success in life is about submitting to you, my great God. This is the heart that God is wanting to cultivate. The question is, are you willing to let him do it? And are you willing to grow in giving and releasing that he might grow this in you? Father, I want to thank you for the time that we've had today in the word. And I pray that the seeds that have been sown, Lord, would grow and bear fruit that leads to true life. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we have considered ourselves owners and not managers. Forgive us, Lord, for not even asking the question so often, Lord, what do you want me to do? Forgive us, Lord, for our selfishness and our self-centeredness. Forgive us for our greed and love of money. Forgive us, Lord. So often ignoring or just not doing the work to even know how it is that you've designed our money to work. 
Lord, we're asking today that you restore a right heart in us. Oh, Father, I thank you that you came to give us new hearts and new life. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit even now is at work growing us. Oh, Father, please don't stop. Pour out your grace upon grace that in our hearts we might learn in ever-increasing ways to be submitted to you. That our great joy with money would be to run back up toward the cash register, so to speak, and say, look, look, I did exactly what you asked, and it was so good. Father, would we long to see the smile on your face? Would we long to hear from your voice, well done, good and faithful servant? And would we trust that doing it your way, you will take care of all the rest. You give more and more to those who are faithful. You provide in abundance. So Father, teach us to live in submission to you. Grow our stewardship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for watching this Bible teaching from Island Community Church. We want to encourage you to join us in person for worship soon. For more information about our worship gatherings, gospel resources, and ways to connect with ICC, you can visit us at iccmemphis.com or download our Owling Community Church app. As we close, we offer a prayer blessing for you from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.